So why I ask, this is actually the first of a bunch of sessions that I have to put on the schedule, um, was I asked to, to get them put on the schedule to have a session with each of the primary teams of the two to find out what your requirements are for Upstart, what your issues you had with Upstart are, um, hopefully use it to um, influence some direction and changes, and talk about what possibilities for Maverick, and especially post Maverick, we should do with your section. Um, server, obviously, I'm sure we're going to focus on, but status doesn't return a good error code. Uh, they're going to focus on the service tool and things like that. Um, for desktop, I suspect, we'll probably, I don't know what we'll talk about, but I suspect two things will be a tool to um, what type of tools we want in the desktop to manage upstart jobs, and also possibly talk about having upstart in the user managed user session jobs. But I mean, I'm hoping this will be more desktop team talking to me than me talking to desktop team. That was a hint. <laughs> right. So, well, one thing that I would like to see is, I mean, it came up a couple of times, is to, to allow more services to be started, like on demand and other food. Mm -hmm. Like Kaban here in CAPS, so just to name two or five examples which come up, but maybe we should look in some more depth about Okay, so we have. Um, I'm just going to go into the projector that's over there, isn't it? I mean, can I swap the e comments out? Um, we have, I'm going to put something on the projector here because this is kind of a sneak peek of the talk I'm going to give um, in well, tomorrow, but it's relevant for this session. I'm hoping the talk will either be late, early or late, not halfway in the middle. Also, people are away. Huh? So people are away. No, so it kind of, it's one of things. Yeah. I have my wonderful XR and R command, which should work. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Unfortunately, it always crashes compass. <laughs> Hmm. It does, every time. It crashes confidence. Confidence <coughs> doesn't like three rapid changes of the display. Each one crashes it. So, what I was going to show you. Oh, this bit. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, it's a bit of a Right, so that's what we have at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. um, it almost fits on the screen. Um, yeah, that's what we have at the moment. We have. Um, <coughs> to move the projector over. We have user session here. This is the session applications where things like Nautilus, NMAP, GNOME Power Manager live. And we have the system services down here, Ulysses, Network Manager, UPAP. Um, we've pretty much moved system services to Upstart at this point, at least the ones at the top level, like DBUS and so on. Um, the next bit is going to be to make sure that all the DBUS services are also managed by Upstart. So when you connect to a DBus service name via DBus daemon, which doesn't exist yet, rather than run it itself, it will use Upstart to um, execute the service. So you'll have um, you'll see an up init control list, and you'll get a status on a service that's actually started by the system bus. So system bus activation and session bus activation eventually will work for Upstart, right? So that would be quite nice. So things so like... Do we need to change DBuzz itself for this? Or will um, just, yeah, I've just I've had the patch for about a year. I've just never applied it. It's really... Fortunately, because DBuzz is cross-platform, adding a third, you know, adding a Unix fork, Windows fork, and adding an upstart fork was actually relatively easy. Mm -hmm. um, what you do is you put in the... You have still have the service files at the moment. I don't mean, really simply you still have the service files, and you just add a service equals line to them, and uh, that tells it to use up... Sorry, upstart equals line. And that tells it... if. if Try using upstart first, then fall back to using these the, the old fashioned way. So we'll probably extend that later to be better, but right now it's quite easy, but it gives us what we want. And so first so we can actually do activation of things like HAL as a DBUS service from upstart as well as from so we could have HAL, we could actually have an upstart job for HAL again. Uh, this one that's activated when you connect on the DBUS bus or uh, you know, at other points that you need it. So that's kind of on-demand activation, I think, is kind of um, useful. That's one. That's the most useful on-demand activation. You know, like on DBus, so like on DBus, DBus, yeah. I mean, that's a really, you know, that's true of the system. So that's true of the system. It's also true of the session. Now, since we would have this on the system bus, it makes sense to have the same thing on the session bus and have upstart manage session um, 
bus connected services, right? Now, to do this, we need, Upstart needs to know about the session. So it needs to know about the display environments and all the environment variables that make the session the session. Uh, it needs to know about multiple sessions, so it needs to know which session you're running in. Um, it then makes sense to have Upstart be managing the dbus session bus for each session because, so when you create a session, you create the session bus as part of that. So rather than in the, so what I'm thinking there is rather than in the session script starting dbus launch, you start, you tell Upstart about the session and that gives you a dbus as part of that. Okay. And that dbus then in that session is, um, will, Right. It's like banana fruit. Um, and um, to get the debus in that session will still be available, all the environment will still be available to the, to the session script, just as it is now. But as well as a debus there, you also got a complete upstart session. So therefore, upstart can do debus session bus activation of services for that for any session. Right? Okay. So is that already in the version? So that upstart no. is able to. Mm -hmm. To be involved by using the It'll be Maverick. Yeah, this is all Maverick. Um, all Maverick. So this, what, what this was given, would, would give us is the, so that you can get in control of the server too. You, you start the normal user and you can see your debug session and you can restart your own session bus and so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. which will be quite cool. Um, since we since we'll then do that, it also makes sense maybe to move some other bits into the session. So actually. Things like GNOME sessions running at the moment, which are really services, not applications with you know, anything which is application. Yeah, anything like Nautilus and AMAP, all that kind of crap can stay as a GNOME session launched. Anything not session managed, um, so this is important. GNOME session is not, the way everyone always goes, oh, we can replace session management within it. Well, no, because you still need the X session management part. You need all, you know, to remember yeah. where the windows were. I don't want to put that up. So. That's more like a joke. So I was referring mm -hmm. to things like you know, the, the screen save for exposed audio, so yeah. stuff which doesn't actually appear on your screen. Exactly. You Anything that doesn't actually need to be session managed, you know, as in you know, restore state if you... Yeah. you know, like, like when you say the session restore the session, there are things that are session managed and there are things that are system service, sorry, session services that would be started restarted anyway. They don't need session managed. Anything that's a session service, we could then move to upstart. So you would have session services like, as you said, screensaver and so on. Now, the interesting thing about this is the defining environment for a session is things like display. That's pretty much the X authority, and, you know, the X cookie. Those things are the defining for a session. And dollar user, oddly enough, and dollar home and all those kind of things. Except the dollar user and dollar home aren't really defining for a session. They're defined per user. <coughs> a user has um, unique dollar user, dollar home. They, a user can have many sessions. So a system can have many users, a user can have many sessions. So basically the plan is to stick a layer in between the two. Um, now, the idea here is that um, you have your system services managed by Upstart, you have your session managed by Upstart, um, and in, when you create a session, you're also going to create these user sessions, these, these user sessions will be implicitly created. So, a user session exists all the time that user has one or more sessions on the system open, right? So it makes sense for things in, so for, for your session services like Greensaver, you put them in the top, but for user services, you only actually need one of them per user. You don't need a copy of Pulse Audio for every session the user has. If the user logs in twice, you only need, still only need one copy of Pulse Audio. Yeah, you also don't want one. You also don't want one. Like, in fact, this is a big problem we have with multi C right now. You log in twice, you end up with two fighting services owned by that user. Well, they don't particularly fight because console kit only ever gives the current foreground console access to the Yes. Elsa device. Well, no, the no, other no, 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 no. Multi seek, you can have two full run consoles. That's true. Yeah. SSH engine is certainly a usability issue yeah. because mm. you, know, you have to add your. Um, so the idea here is we add this second layer in, which is trivial to do, and then things in this. So we have system services running on the system as root or whatever. You have the, then you have the session services, things like the screensaver running in the session, which are, and then you have the session managed applications on top. Um, and then in between the two, we have these user services. The user services are running as long as the user has a login. Uh, SSH agent is pretty much a typical example, the GBFSD, Pulse Audio. One cute thing about this means if you're logged in at X, and you, you know, you've got your SSH agent running, obviously, and you've added the keys to it, your SSH agent, and you, log, you go to control F1, you log in on the terminal, your SSH agent still works. It's the same SSH agent shared between all your logins. 
So you can, uh, yeah. you can say and the number, things like GPFSD is the same. A number of people are doing this right now with enormously hacky shell scripts yeah. of death. So. Yeah, this turns out to be much, much easier by teaching the people about that. So when we talk about, when I, if I ever talk about Rupia, talking about GNOME Session and Upstart, I still really believe we need a session manager like GNOME Session to do the accession management protocol, to do the yeah. saving of window positions, saving of window states, and all that stuff. But I think for things that shouldn't be session managed, like services that sit in the session, we should do upstart for that. And then we should also have this user services like that in between the two. Mm. So okay. this was, would basically not really change like the processes and how and which processes are started for the first session, which is applied to the next one, like the second session. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't really change the, the number of processes that we start the first right. session. Or no, the number of processes we start, we start the, the first session, session would stay constant. Mm -hmm. One thing about this, though, is that because we can then use up, we're using Upstart for this, we can start taking advantage of the memory plan, start on idle, start on um, demand kind of services. So SSH agent, for example, we can have the socket already ready, and um, the SSH agent process might not really be run until you first actually connect to the socket. There's, a mass, there's another massive benefit to all this right now. It's completely impossible to uh, configure LD preload out of the library path in your uh, in your room session in your room RC because SSH agent is set gate yes. and therefore the mm -hmm. runtime maker scripts anything that might be dangerous. Yeah. So yeah. the huge benefit to not having it be the parent of the session. Yeah, exactly. And um, so we, we so SSH agent and socket will exist, the process doesn't have to exist straight away. Um, for things like GBFS the again the the, the service exists in potentially until you actually try and connect to it, because we're going to do session bus activation, Upstart doesn't actually need to start that process. So the slot exists for that process to exist, but the process doesn't need to be started. In fact, in practice, it gets started on login anyway, because everything tries to connect to these things, but we can... Well, but what, what it certainly would need to provide is like a kind of a Unix socket proxy for, yeah. for stuff like SSH agent, because we, we need the socket address exported in all these... Right, yeah, we, I think the Apple approach to this is the right thing, where you use a predictable, unpredictable name, if that makes sense. Yeah. Or an unpredictably predictable name. No, a predictable, unpredictable name. <laughs> I, once you know the unpredictable name part of it, you can predict the name of the... Yeah, it's yeah like but that's star cons. Yeah. <laughs> so that's actually the entire reason why we have to start like things like SSH engine as a wrapper and yeah. extension. Can, yeah, because do that, all the processes need the amount of variables. Yeah. Likewise with the T-Pass session path. So this is why, well, I'm still quite unclear how this works. So if we don't launch this right away, how do the <coughs> processes that already run get the connection to the session bus? So what you do instead is you, you revert it. You have the session in Upstart says, ah, well, this session includes an SSH agent and so on. SSH agent listens on slash bar slash run slash some socket dash nonce slash SSH. Whereas the some socket dash nonce right now is SSH dash. You just make that session dash. Mm -hmm. And then in that directory you have slash SSH, slash pulse audio, slash GBFSD, every socket exists under this directory. So you have a, a random named file run directory per session type thing. But within that you have set addresses. Is that necessary? I mean, uh, OpenSSH creates that um, socket by itself. Um, and it doesn't want to. And it would be it would be nice to leave that alone, but I mean it's it's a random name anyway. Yeah. Um, right. So what I what I was thinking was if we can come up with some way for SSH agent to communicate that. Well, no, because no, so that means you have to start SSH agent. The idea is you know, <coughs> by having something else see the socket name and just having SSH agent use that socket name that's already been preceded. Oh, you don't need to start SSH agent. So everything like this has to be modified? Everything like this has already been modified. I, the, the four services we want to do this for have already do this. They already was, accept the bus address. I was sort of hoping that, yeah, I see, I see, what, I see what you mean. But. So the SSH agent socket exists before. You create the SSH agent socket, you, you, will you create be able a slot to, in the process table, but not the service table, but you don't actually start SSH agent to the socket. You will be able to correctly set SSH agent PID. Yes, right. That's the one that you can You'll set. You'll only be able to set a set of sock. Yeah. But that seems to be all you need. If not, there's I, I, I think it's the main thing you need. Um, yeah. So if anyone's even got a Mac here, they care to borrow. Try to borrow. So. My God, you're all good people. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> see, I love these sessions for that. You, you, you have the only Mac device in the room. Right? I have the only Mac device in the room, and I don't come with a terminal on them. But if I was to show you that, I could show you the, this batch. Actually, hang on, I've got a video on here. Let me just. 
um, let me just show you how this works on Apple because it's quite cute and everyone should look at it. Because Apple, oh look, lots of dots too. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't think they've contributed it to open search. Okay. Well, it's still oh, no, no, it's uh, search. Right, so. Oh, a terminal screenshot of a video of a version of a video. <laughs> <laughs> How much technology do you need to print some characters? Right, so he's going to demo here no SSH agent running. Okay. Yeah, he's, there we go. The person at Google's now finished. So then he runs SSH agent add. And there's an SSH or sub. We see the launch bit is actually the nonce here. That's just yeah, the same. So SSH agent isn't running, but that's actually set. Do you know why SSH didn't ask for a? Oh, maybe he's using passwords as keys. Yeah, I think he's. I don't know what he's just demoing. Now, right now it works. Oh, so you have to run SSH out. No, twice. I don't know why he's done that. I that's think he's a bit done. rubbish if it's true. Yeah, no, I don't think he's done that. I think that's wrong. And then you end up with the agent. I don't know what he's talking about. But yeah, basically the idea is that's probably not the right one. This talk was given him at Google. It was. And could see it at the Yeah, moment. and then he gets into big trouble because he tries to stop the session and then his ex server keeps responding on him. <laughs> <laughs> it all goes very wrong. But anyway, so yeah, that's the idea. You, you, the socket exists first. So the socket address exists first and is seen in session before the other session. And right. that's so that essentially all the Unix things are very old and they work that way. But most things will be using dbus bus activation. Sure, sure. Dbus, and we'll do the same for dbus. We'll yeah, pre the dbus bus address into the session before we even starting the dbus. So, so, so it would be something like um, upstart set, some some environment variable that's uh, sufficiently um, upstartish rather than Ubuntu. Yeah, if you see exactly. what I mean, so that we can uh, so that we can get a patch into things like OpenSSH yeah. that uses it if. Upstart is present. Correct, exactly that. Because yeah. it already looks for launch day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that means we, we basically we, we don't create like proxy sockets from upstart, but we, we modify packages like let's say all cups to accept this additional environment. Yeah. Like with lift cups is pretty much the same problem, so yeah. Those you, you, you've got this small or cup socket, but I think the, the cup socket is predictable at least. Yeah. So that makes it easier. Be, but yeah, cup sort of wanders towards using the bus, wanders away from using the wanders towards using the But I mean, in this case, you, you already need the socket to be present so that lib cups doesn't get confused. Correct. Yeah, well, we, we, we're going to have really. to make some sockets. And, mm. yeah, we're going to have to do some INET stuff in Upstart, it's unavoidable, but I just, I still want to try and farm that out to a separate thread where I'm going to have a privilege and stuff. But I mm. still don't want pre OD1 listening to the ports. But CUPS, we want to run all the time. We want to uh, no, we do not want no. to run only if, uh, when the first print job is set. Ah, no, no. CUPS, you actually want to do something far more interesting. CUPS, you actually... So you're quite correct in that you need CUPS. You want CUPS running because you've got this whole idea that you've got to discover printers and you've got to discover... You know, they might be sitting in the printer queue. But you actually... You don't want it running all the time, really urgently, as early in the boot sequence. Cups is something we can accept 20, 30 yeah. seconds. We must, the other. only thing is uh, we must <coughs> we must start cups before Zamba gets started. Otherwise, uh, Zamba cannot share pointers. Yeah. Well, that's not true, actually. Zamba can, Zamba actually failed to connect to cups and just give up with printers. And currently, this does not work as cups is a simple in its script and right. not up, upstart job. Yeah, so let me, give you, let me give you how I see cups working in upstart. And this is, this is a very good example of, for those who are still playing along in the gallery of why I think the system, the only approach, doesn't work. Um, it works great for Apple, but we need something more complicated. Um, we, CUPS has many reasons to be started. First of all, we simply want to start it on boot. We need CUPS started on boot because we've got to deal with discovery of printers, we've got to deal with anything left in the print queue CUPS needs to deal with. But we actually want to start that on idle after boot because it's not urgent to get the document printed halfway through the boot sequence. We can accept the fact the desktop's going to come up first and the user's going to load Firefox and they're going to start browsing going on Facebook. And then once they're on Facebook and they're only reading their messages and the CPU's gone, <coughs> through, then sure, we'll start that. And then the document will print. Yes, yes. And so the right. same we so must we have, think for Samba that Samba also right. does not need. So we have, start on, we have a start on idle thing. We actually might be Samba already. We have to start an idle thing for cups. We want to start cups on demand if the user hits print at any point. 
So we actually not only need to start it always on boot, we actually need to start it on demand on socket connection because when the user hits print, we want cups to immediately come up, then the print dialog come up. So is that essentially in case cups hasn't got one to start yeah, yet? Yeah, in case cups are still, you know, the user's on yeah. Firefox, the cups just, must they're playing off. Farmville and they've just hit open office. You know, the CPU's not going to go idle. Right. If you load open office, the CPU's never going to go idle again. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they're going to hit print. They need to, we, you know, we might not start cups yet. You know, leave boot in, hit open office. It's not idle yet. The cups isn't started, but they hit print. You need to get cups up now. So it will be started on socket connection. We need to start cups if the, the, when the DBus stuff. Good. You know, we need to start on DBus service activation potentially later, or whenever the DBus stuff happens. And as you pointed out, we have services like Samba which depend on cups. So if Samba is a higher priority service and is dragged in as a dependency of something and gets started, that needs to go bring cups up because Samba needs cups. So there are many, many reasons to start cups. Not just on demand. Cups. Not just on you start on demand on dependency on idle on boot. You know, there are many reasons, and the sphere of all of them is what we can do with our We should probably do something similar with Samba to, to yeah. also avoid starting there. Yeah, Samba like you need to do, um, let me remind you, isn't it? Well, if you, you need use... it to be able to do it, to do name, name lookup, so if you have network shares in Nautilus, they need, you need to bring Samba up there and then. You need to bring Samba needs to become a dependency desktop. If, that's why you would need on, the, on connection again. Yes. And then Samba must pull in cups as dependency. Yeah. I've just a tedious detail. Um, I've been on systems with several hundred users logged in at once. Mm -hmm. Is that or if you run into Pilot and Linux? No. Does PID1 not? Uh, yeah, but it also boxes around with its own process limits all the time. So does it set our limit uh, open, to, yeah. open to infinity? Yes, yeah, and it modifies the thing in prop that lets it maximize the open number of files on the system. Right. It boxes so around with that a lot. But so, it doesn't, it doesn't so we aren't going to run into hard kernel limits for the no. number per process? No, there aren't any, fortunately, in Linux anymore. Okay, good. It, 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 so, um, I kind of want to make it the moment, but, <coughs> back, but I kind of want to make it so um, they have this sort of PID 1, 2, uh, the 2 is the privilege, 1, 1 isn't, but 1 forks the other processes, 2 is privileged and has more stuff out of it. Oh, and uh, 1 still deals with all the stuff that only PID 1 can do. Yeah, but. exactly. So there, there'll be this sort of more, you know, the great thing about threads, they end up throwing an on share is that you can have things that look a lot like threads but aren't really threads, they're more like processes with a lot of shared memory. And, yeah, well, I guess one additional reason to start up CAPS or also Samba would be some, if there's some incoming TCP connection on port 631, for example, yeah. which would be like the identity thing. Yeah. Or it start it or at least block the TCP incoming TCP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, so there's not, you need lots and lots of reasons to start processes, and that's you know why it's, I think we're going to do it this way. And you know, you could start having unprivileged services. You know, Samba could have a user service per user. And, you know, there's all sorts of things we can extend this to do. But focusing on just getting the system started right now would be really nice. Okay. Um, so that's kind of yeah, that's user session. We'll still have GNOME session running these things, and um, yeah, GNOME session will still put Nautilus back up or any you know things back up because you had them running last time. We'll then have Upstart running some, I don't really put it in the slide, but we'll have Upstart running some services in the user session, things like screens over and stuff, which always come back up no matter what. Um, we'll have Upstart running user services, like SSH, Agent, GFPT, VFSD, Pulse Audio, and Upstart running the system services. And there'll be bus, DBus bus activation all the week. And then you go, go, you control it. Nice list of processes, including your own. So that was that. Was that. Um, right, how much time do we use half an hour? Does anyone want to talk about that a bit more? Everyone's stunned into silence. Okay, um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was in here was um, well, is there any other, so other than GUI tools for Upstart, what other desktop e requirements for Upstart do we think we have? Yeah. Hmm? Yes, yes, so with regard to, to GUI tools, I haven't read the, the you know, current GNOME you know, system tools yet. So they have a tool to enable the same upstart job suddenly, yeah. but I haven't looked at it yet because probably most of the upstart jobs you shouldn't really offer to offer to users to get disabled because then you end up with an unbootable machine. But how does it disable them? Hmm? What is it? How does it disable them? That's, I don't know, I haven't taken a look at it. So we don't currently ship it in Bootsy because no one got around to, to vetting it. But. Mm -hmm. So 
So I guess the official method to disable is like to rename the config file to dot disable. Or to comment out the start on line. I prefer comment out the start on line, but it's me. Comment out the start on line instead. Uh, but then, then, then you need to, to modify the actual file. You do, but the, so it's, so it, 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 it's it sucks either way. The, um, mm -hmm. If you if you just rename it, then you're going to find that if oh, you, you upgrade, 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 yeah. upgrade, upgrade, then rename back, then you get a new version of the yeah. Yeah. file. Yeah, and also, and new, once you have problems, yeah. which is even worse. Well, I guess once you upgrade, then you, you get the file back because you get the disabled file. No, the no, file. no, no package doesn't put it back. What the package knows about the dot disable? Yeah, no, if you, 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 you root the oh, file, yeah, of course, you put it back. So you, yeah, but still, you end up with two branches. Of the so, in fact, you'll end up with a package disk or yeah. something. Basically, a rename the comp file is still just a comp file change as far as detail yeah, is concerned. True. So, you still get the same comp file prompt as if you modify the file. Okay, um, so we should rather. Like, Comment on the start on. I do. Uh, there's nothing correct you can do with the uh, with the way I'm starting yeah. to set the jobs right so now. So David's. Yeah, but well, we could at least do it consistently so that the documentation is. ignores the yeah, we should, the same thing. We should fix the disable it, and then you should share the two. Fix it. We should provide a way to disable jobs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> which is already on the platform portion. Well, which uh, which well, well, let's upgrade our C disable, which is currently what that seems to use. But. Well, Scott has a plan for this. Yeah. So, David Summer Code Student is going to be working on system tools back in, and he's on from IRC. Yeah. Hello. There's always a lag for us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I thought I'd talk a little bit in this session as well about things like the saving services, what the plan is there. Um, so, one thing I tend to dislike in designs of systems is when the disabled service, you click to say, if you imagine a GUI and you've got a list of services and you have a package and you have DBUS, you click DBUS, you click disable. Right now, if you rename that to comp disabled and you stop the service, it'll vanish from the list. So how do you enable it again? What do you mean it'll vanish? Well, because if you've renamed it to comp disabled, you upstart will forget about it. Therefore, it's gone from the list. But I thought we just agreed to like commenting on these. No, 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 right. Don't, don't worry. I'm just giving you an example. Oh, I, don't okay. like, I don't like the whole idea of disabling services. It means that Upstart doesn't know about them, um, which is kind of... I'm totally for base services not being displayed to the user in the graphical tool. We'll worry about yeah. that. Yeah, that's... Yeah. that's Let's that's, worry about that. That's sort of thing. So what I, what I prefer with disabling services is not... We, I don't use the term disabling services. So Upstart has the concept of can a service be run, should a service be run, and activating the service, they set the, uh, the three-layer things it does. Now, the only thing it really needs to, you only need to disable in that, is the activating of the service. You, you actually, for if you disable DBus for whatever reason, because you don't like booting, um, let's say you disable Apache, let's use that, or Sam, actually that's a really good example. Sam is kind of one you often want to disable because you don't want someone rooting your box. Uh, that's just unfair, Sam's always secure. S send mail. We want to disable send mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say we want to disable send mail. Or postfix, or whatever else. You know, we want to disable that service. Actually, I always, yeah, that's a good example. You don't want it vanishing from the list of services that start knows about. You don't want it, you know, you want to still have a degree of control over that service as a sysadmin. You simply don't want to start starting it on boot. So when I talk about disabling services, what I actually will you're going to talk about is talking about manual services. Um, this is something I've ripped off entirely from SMS. Um, basically, when what Upstart 10 will provide is this idea that you place a service can be an automatic mode, which is the default, or a manual mode, which is the um, non-default. Um, you place the service in manual mode. What that would mean is that the service will still exist. It will show up, still show up in a control list. Just Upstart itself will never take any action to start that. However, start postfix enter will still work. If you as a sysadmin type start postfix enter, it'll work. Because Upstart still knows about the service, it will still start the service. If you start it, it will still manage it for you, it will still supervise it. But then it's up to you to type stop postfix. So that means if we would disable the start online, then Upstart wouldn't know like its dependencies, it couldn't start. Right, exactly. Start. But then this will, this because this is, if they're placing it in a manual mode, will mean it will still know all of its whiles and yeah. everything else. It will still be able to do anything that Nort 10 does to bring up dependency mm -hmm. services first. But it means that Nothing in that start will start this. You know, its dependencies won't start because you placed it in manual mode. You know, all of these things will be true. However, if you as a sysadmin type start postfix, enter, it'll start. So you can have a service in manual mode can be started by you manually. That's why it's called manual mode. 
It's yeah. really a disabled service from everyone else's point of view, but it isn't because, from my point of view, Upsol will still let you start it. it just, a disabled service would mean Upsol wouldn't let you start it. A disabled service is one which, in upstart terminology, for which the executable path is missing, i.e. the comp file is left but the service is gone. That's a disabled service. It doesn't show up in your control list, even though the comp file exists. A manual service is one that shows up in your control list but has been met marked by the sysadmin to only be startable by the sysadmin. And this marked by is by now, it's like a manual line in the comp Exactly what it is. So okay. you add the word manual to the comp file, and anywhere? Any, like, anywhere in the comp file, yeah, yeah. yeah. Except, of course, the obvious bits like scripts. But so that still involves modifying the comp files. So that's kind of icky. But you can do that. That's allowed. You can, they're comp files. They're comp files for a reason, because they're configuration. So you place manual in the comp file, it will now be in manual mode. However, we're all, I'm also providing the override stuff we talked about, which is um, the upstart equivalent of ETC default. It's probably not going to be that directory, because I'm trying not to reuse existing directories. Um, the idea is that you can create a file with a, na a known name, so if you have etc init postfix comp, you could have, say, etc override postfix comp, etc init postfix override, I don't know what to call it yet. Anything in that file is parsed along with the comp file, so they're kind of there, but it's as if it overrides it. So you can have the word, you say you could, if you want to place postfix in manual, let's say you could put in manual into etc override postfix.com, and that will Make place postfix in manual mode. So and th those files aren't supposed to exist. They're supposed to not. You know, packaging does not provide these files, but you can create them and it will override it, and that places it in manual mode. And any control will just do this for you. Don't be a control manual. So it starts to look very similar to UDF rules. So. Like that, you you ship UDF rules and lib, and you use the files. Uh, yeah, no, 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 don't do that. Packaging will always ship etc in it comp postfix comp. Okay. Because that's still a comp file. This having still should be allowed to modify the postfix comp. However, tools should we should not modify comp files. That's like policy 101. So tools can have this override file after the comp file to to override it. And okay. sysadmins can use it as well. Um, you can put environment variables in there, which will be used by the comp file, which override those defaults in the comp file. And you can put in the extra resource limits in there, things like that. So will that be merged with the original file? Or just you copy it and then modify it? It's parsed afterwards. The oh, so it parses the comp file, then parses the override file. Okay. Anything in the override file replaces the same standards are in the comp file. So you could just have a single line manual and yep. then you will done. Yeah. Because it would, then it would keep like comp file changes to future yep. versions and so on. Exactly. That means file it, copies. You can also, for example, um, let me just do this on the big back projector for a second. I don't know. It's not really the right thing to do. So let's say, for example, you have etc in it, postfix.com. Postfix.com could have um, thingy backend is false, exec, da da da. Actually, thingy backend, we will this too. And it could have none backend is thingy backend. So it could have that, right? So that is a postfix. I'm sorry, someone pays that twice. I can't pay it twice either. So you could have etc in a postfix comp, it could have thingy backend is wibble, set an environment variable thingy backend to wibble. The exec line could use dollar thingy backend, right? So that's a fairly simple example. Now this thingy backend is a variable which would be set in postfix's environment, right? This thingy backend variable is, because it's set in the comp file, is overridable by just about everything. If you do start postfix, that's inside a, inside a script section, yeah? No, no, this is just, sorry, if you, yeah, not six syntax requires you put M on there, not ten syntax doesn't require R, because um, it was confusing people. Um, so start postfix thingy backend is what is Frodo will work. This will then run exec backend is Frodo, right? If postfix, you can, it comes from, you, those can come from events as well, but you don't do it. So, Let's say, I just still do not know what to call these files, so I will, make, I will just change it every time I give an example. Let's say you have a postfix override, you can just simply put it in there, bring you back in. And now, if you start postfix, the thingy backend is wibble in the postfix comp is overridden to build on the override file, so the default backend is now build on. But if you start thingy backend Frodo, you get Frodo there. So, so it always passes the configuration part first, and yes. then the arguments of the start line. And so first the file, file, right? the override, then configuration the first, then override, then start. The one that's on the top of those wins. Right, okay. So this means that the override files can behave like etc default does today. Mm -hmm. So you can you can have in your postfix comp some default variables, and I would expect there'll be you know this, these will appear in the init comp as 
this sets the back end, it can be Bill, Wibble, Bilbo, or Frodo, like that. You know, you'd have some, you know, have a comment and that in there. And then tools, I would expect, should pass the comp file, look for these environment variables with comments above it, and offer them as a toggle. And if you toggle them, copy them with comment into the override file. Mm -hmm. So the override file would never exist by default. It's never provided in the packaging system because you're defeating the entire object of having a file in which isn't a comp file or a configuration file or anything else. But if they exist, they can override anything in the postfix comp. And it's perfectly cromulent for a sysadmin to just modify postfix comps themselves. But if you do that, you get a defect comp file comp. Mm -hmm. But I just don't get yeah, override files are for tools to um, override things and write a file that the comp file doesn't. So that seems to, that's that seems to do. I mean, things like Puppet we use these override files. Okay, and so this is what what Jacob's working on already. Yes. Well, this is well, no. This this is for this is dot ten, right? Yeah, this is dot ten. So <laughs> when is when is dot ten going to be available? <laughs> awesome. <to start laughs> when, 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 when is dot ten going to be available for start testing and start writing our our Maverick. article? Cool. Sorry. Sometimes in Maverick time. Frame. Sometime I feel, in I'm, time. I'm, I'm, this is UDS. I'm planning. I'm getting all my features. I'm talking about things. I'm thinking about and hopefully getting feedback from everybody as to what works, what doesn't. Then okay. I'll write down the plan, write the work items, and then I'll be able to tell you. Two quick questions. Uh, what workaround do we have for Lucid for, for, the, for the sysadmins that are going to be using it for the next three to five years? Comment out start online. Services. Sorry? Comment out the start online now to the company. Okay. And um, how, how would you suggest that we display dependencies in a graphical tool? Because services of men, did a, did a good job of just, okay, this is your service, you either turn it on or off the boot. Pass, pass the start on and stop on lines, they're relatively easy to pass. And you can read, if it's start on started some other service, there's a penalty there. Right, but you're using a graphical tool, so. You know. how, how do you display that without cluttering? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Do we? Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I do system stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good at this. I'm not good at this. <laughs> That's a little bit of a The design team are down the hall. They're using Max. Yeah. <laughs> Running the virtual. <laughs> okay. Oh, it, there are some cute things that come after Nord 10 as well. You better I mean, to have debated about the idea is that you, know, you have power states like this is bringing power and you just drag them into the service. So it says this service runs on power, on battery, on low power. You can drag out the on low power. There's a nice little like the design team had people there have some ideas of how to do pretty good. Okay, I'll get in touch with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, any, so yeah, look, me, so, any questions and so on, any comments? Because I think we need to. So, do, does this all work for you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So you're not mad at me for wanting to replace little bits of game session, but or are, you, are you not mad at me for leaving lots of game session? Well, it wouldn't actually modify that much. I no. mean, right now we've got desktop files which are past the game session and they're just being replaced by after Some, of only some of them. Yes, yeah, some, but I mean, yeah. things like... Things that are actually services, services, yeah. Things that game session is not very good at. Yeah. I don't think even screensaver is a debug service right now. GVFS is a debug service, so yeah. not all that much. But no, exactly. So this will always, these will all be replaced wholesale with just debug modification, right? Uh, the, the X session D modification, so that you don't run the session through a debug launch, but right, you run the like session upstart through upstart, upstart, and then yeah, you run the session through upstart, then you get upstart will start the session and things. Right. So things like eventually, you know, session dot, you know, your X session D directory for the shell scripts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I can imagine those will be tasks in upstart, and they'll be run as part of it. You know, eventually. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, so most of them these days just set up environment wide. Yeah, that's why they should be upstart tasks. So they can import the environment into the session. Environment and upstart so that that gets shared by the other services. Mm -hmm. That's why you should be upstart. Eventually. That's not memory. That's after memory. Yeah, one bit at a time. Um, but, oh, right, yeah, Mikhail is not in here, isn't he? No. So the other thing we've, we, I've talked to Mikhail about is also looking at um, doing uh, update notifier type stuff in upstart. So having the session that, session bus and this user session and session stuff in upstart means that you can do things like write a task that uh, every hour, check this, and you know, you've still got display and X authority, so you can have tasks that are just next to them. And it would finally be nice to like kind of upstreamize things that we hack into update notifier, like now, like airport crash notifications. I guess, I suppose there's a thing like whenever there's a file change in more crash, we yeah. bring up that stuff. So, so I would really like to, to convert that to an upstart job, for example. Yeah. 
I've got, so Mikhail's going to look at all the things he does currently on Sun Empire and just write them out as this is what I do when this happens and mm -hmm. we'll make sure all those use cases are there. Yeah. So we've got Apple, we've got the, the jockey yeah. firmware thing. Certainly, when a file exists in this directory, run this task with the file name, is very much in scope for what yeah. that was And the other is that just based on an up, it's not a UDF event. So whenever we've got a firmware, sub, uh, firmware subsystem event, yeah. run this. Yeah. And I think this would, it's probably already possible with the upstart rules, except yeah. that can only it cannot stop stuff as the user, but huh? yes, yes, yes. Mm. <coughs> yeah, that's that's nice. So. To bring update notifier back to the original purpose. And yeah, that's what. Hey, look, this look, it's a uh, problem there. But yes, upstart's actually off off here as well. Upstart kind of it listens to you that you event netlink as well. I just didn't put that on here because it's not about this. <coughs> But you'll be able to see yes, you can use your events in that stuff. Yeah. So, so I think the, the bit that's missing right now is to be able to use per user events and per user actions and all. Correct. So yeah. But then, uh, yeah, what Upstart will give you as well is you'll be able to run things based on your events in a user session. So you can say, oh, cancel, cancel, cancel. You'll yeah. be able to say, um, you will be you will be able to say on a firmware event in the user session pop up as well, which is really good. Yeah, that's exactly what we do with firmware events. Yeah, it's even so they will even allow us to implement a very simple auto mounter instead of Nautilus, mm -hmm. because there's there's quite some requests for that. So people folks who don't want to use Nautilus and want a simple just auto mounter then yeah, that would sound like a free line after. It would probably be a free line. Free. So yeah, we took that. Okay, plus one, plus two. This isn't planning for the next LCS.